Okay, so we're on chapter five of Daniel and um, uh, the events so far from Daniel chapter one through Daniel four have, although they have obviously involved Daniel and his friends who've been brought from Babylon, uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon, they have been predominantly focused on Nebuchadnezzar and his, um, his dream in chapter two, which Daniel uh, interpreted and then the outworking of that dream in chapter four and the way that God humbled him. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar died in about 532 BC. Um, he, uh, he it was who uh, uh, started the first of the three sieges of Jerusalem and was king over them. Um, he's the one, the empire, the emperor of the Babylonian empire that we can uh, looking at and he's going to die in 562 BC after ruling for about 43 years and his son um, is going to succeed him which is normal um, but what happens in the following years after Nebuchadnezzar is, dies is that there's going to be a series of takeover bids between his son and then uh, one of his sons and then another son and then a grandson and, and so for the next few years uh, the throne is going to change hands. Um, and that's all going to happen without report in Daniel's book. You know, you, you'd have to look at, um, at history books. You can catch it in Second Kings and in uh, Jeremiah and in uh, Chronicles. You can catch the different people. And you could be reading it thinking, there's a lot of discrepancy here in the names, especially in the way they're described, because very often, uh, as you see in, Bel in chapter five of Daniel, Belshazzar is going to be uh, called the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but he, he's not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He is just an ancestor of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the way it was written in those days, that you, would, you were a son if you were descended from. So we, um, so as you're reading it, uh, I've made a note with 2 Kings 25 and Jeremiah 52. Uh, as I said before last week, if you want all these scriptures, uh, later, we can, I'll send them to you, send me an email and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll send you a list of the scriptures. But um, this kind of continual changeover is going to carry on to 539 BC. So what's that? Roughly 25 years. It's going to carry on. Yes, my math is a little long way around. But anyway, roughly 25 years, there's going to be this kind of toing and growing. And um, the first son that's going to succeed him is someone called Evil Merodach, which I think is always such an unfortunate name, Evil Merodach. He's going to rule for two years. He's going to be murdered by his brother-in-law. And, uh, and then the kingdom's going to be taken over by him. And then at his death, he's going to be succeeded by his son, who's going to rule only for two months. And then he's going to be assassinated and succeeded by someone called Nabonidus, who's going to reign for 70 years. Um, and at his death, his son um, uh, is going to take over. So Nabonidus is going to set about restoring the glory of the Babylonian Empire, because inevitably, when there's infighting, there is uh, a kind of sense that the empire gets forgotten, which is what happened to the Roman Empire. The empire gets forgotten, and there's all this, who's going to happen? Who's going to have the power? And so when Nabonidus takes over, his whole point, his whole focus is let's restore the glory of the Babylonian Empire. And um, you know, there's probably loads of pictures we can take from that. Um, lots of pictures we can take from, uh, you can see it through history, as I say, that's what happened with the Roman Empire. There was so much infighting and so many people who wanted power that the extension of the empire gradually declined and um, uh, yeah and they started to fall um, but here anyway Nabonidus starts to do that his mother is a high priestess of the moon god and at Haran and probably because of her influence he starts not only building the empire but restoring the religion rebuilding the temples that had fallen into decay um, he was away from Babylon a lot, and uh, Belshazzar was his eldest son. So when you read that Belshazzar, the king, uh, was the king, actually he was uh, he had been ruling in Babylon for a while, 
um, because Nirvana Das had been around doing what he was doing. Um, so it was a kind of co-regency, not a single regency. That may not interest you at all. I don't know. I don't know if it interests you. Those things interest me. It interests me about how that invite went on. But what it does do is it puts to rest the argument about whether the different books of the Bible are saying something different. So when you look at the history of the Babylonian Empire and you trace the kings and how and who they were and what they did, it puts to, to rest some of the differences that you get when you're reading Jeremiah or Second Kings or some of those. And that's important, isn't it? Because people are constantly saying that the Bible contradicts itself, that it says something different in different places. They say that often without ever reading the Bible, but, but, but they do, they latch onto those things and so it's good to know. So um, Belshazzar's king, and before we get into Daniel chapter five, I thought we would just look at um, Isaiah 47 and 48, because Isaiah was preaching at least a hundred years, maybe more, before what happens in, in chapter five of Daniel is already talking about the demise of the Babylonian Empire. And he's very specific about it. And in Daniel, uh, in Isaiah 47, and uh, and 48, sorry, I've been asked to move back a little bit. There you go, is that better? I don't know if that's better, but there you go. I've been asked to move back. Um, so I want to go, yeah, Isaiah 47 and 48, and hopefully, I don't know if you make notes in the side of the Bible on the sidebar, but I make notes in my actual Bible, and they're really helpful for me because now I can go through the sidebar of the, of the, the of Isaiah, and I can tell you what, what the kind of titles of each of the segment. What you see is that God, through Isaiah, says in Isaiah 37 verse 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, remove your veil, strip off the skirt, uncover the leg, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame will be exposed. I will take vengeance and not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the Queen of kingdoms. So this is even before Babylon is actually a nation. This is the, the, the prophecy, or not a nation, but in, before it's an empire. It's the prophecy of the downfall of the people that God is going to use to discipline Israel. In Habakkuk, he, Habakkuk is going to cry out, how long will you make me see, let me see violence? How long will you let this go on? And God answers Habakkuk in chapter one, and he says, if I told you what I was going to do, you would be astonished. I'm going to bring a wicked and desperate people, and they are going to come against you. That's in Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, at the end, he, he kind of believes everything that God has said, and he says, those wonderful verses, you know, though the fig tree shall not blossom and there be no figs out on the vine, yet I will praise you. And then fruit on the vine, yet I will praise you. And that's the thing, isn't it? You know, that's the wonder of scripture, the wonder of the prophecies that, that, that God tells Habakkuk, I'm bringing an evil and wicked people to discipline my, my people Israel. And he's already told Isaiah that they're going to come and they're going to do that, but also they're going to be destroyed. So it's like, you know, here's God, and it's, okay, this is what's going to happen, and it's going to be terrible, and you're not going to like it. It's going to be hard. I am going to punish wickedness. But at the same time, those who know my name can trust that I will redeem, I will save, I will deliver. And I think that's just the most amazing truth in Scripture. But at the same time that judgment is being poured out, wrath is being poured out, there is always the opportunity for repentance. Mm -hmm. Always the opportunity for salvation. And it will never be taken away. We will go through Revelation, even though I believe the church will be gone largely through uh, Revelation, between Revelation 6 and 19. Nonetheless, there is still going to be a gospel preached in the mid heaven. I mean, can you, it, it's just incredible. But at the same time, God is pouring out his wrath. At the same time, that the Revelation 6 says that men are going to hide in caves, knowing it's the wrath of God, 
and they're going to cry out, save us from the wrath of God and of the Lamb. So at the same time they're doing that, at the same time Revelation keeps on repeating, their wickedness increases, their evil increases, they did not repent, they did not repent. God is still having an eternal gospel preached in the heavenly places. I mean, it's just a wonderful example of the grace and the love of God for mankind. You know, it matches John 3.16, for God so loved the world, for God so loved this world, the people of this world, that he gave us over the God's son. And that son will be preached throughout the wrath of God at the end of time. So when we're trying to talk to people about the end times and the judgment and everything else, I really think we need to major on that. <laughs> it will be terrible. It is coming. It is definitely coming. But God will make sure that people will know the gospel. You know, how many times we hear Christians say, I just can't believe God could be so horrible. I just can't believe that he could do that, that he could send all this terrible judgment. You know, I just, so therefore I just don't believe it's going to happen. But if they knew, for example, that God is going to preach this gospel, he's going to actually select people to go into all the world. We talked about this. Remember in Revelation 7, we read that God selects 144,000 Jewish men and they are sent into all the world. And I've often wondered, why would that be? Why are they the ones chosen to preach the gospel? And then I realized, think about Israel today. Most Israelis speak more than one language. Most of them speak more than one language. Who better to be missionaries around the world, especially if the church is gone? Who better to send with the gospel message? And many, 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 I believe hundreds of thousands of people will come to the Lord Jesus during that last book of God. And I think those chapters in Revelation bear that out. So now when I'm reading Isaiah chapter 47, at a time before the, the Babylonian Empire was the Babylonian Empire, and he's saying, you know, you better realise that you are no longer going to be called the Queen of Kingdoms. They've not even been called the Queen of Kingdoms yet. And yet God is already telling them of their um, demise. And it's important for us because there's so many prophecies that are still yet to be fulfilled. And I know that I'm talking to people who know this online and here, people who know this. But it's really important for us because if God is saying this when he said this, we can be sure that what has not yet happened will happen. And he's going to go on through this Isaiah 47 I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. But he's talking about this 70 year captivity where Judah, Judah, who was the only part of Israel left in, uh, in the land of Israel at this time, Judah and Benjamin, who together are called Judah, he's going to give them into the hand of the Babylonians, Chaldeans. You did not show mercy to them, he's saying to the Babylonians. On the aged you made your yoke very heavy, yet you said, I will be a queen forever. These things you did not consider nor remember the outcome of them. Now hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children. But these two things will come on you suddenly in one day. Loss of children and widowhood will come on you in full measure. In spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells, you felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. But you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. But evil will come on you, which you will not know how to charm away, and disaster will fall on you, for which you cannot atone, and destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly. And for the sake of time, I can't read all the way through 47 and 48, but I mean, we've just come out of the study of Isaiah. It'd be really good to go back into these last chapters and look at how God talks about what he's going to do to the very people that he raises up to discipline Israel, to discipline Judah. And his biggest 
uh, criticism of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians, is that they have said in their heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. That's the, the, the Babylonian empire. We saw it in chapter four of Daniel when, when Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to make a statue to himself, a statue of gold, and that everyone must bow down and worship this statue. We saw that, that he is saying, I am, and there is no one beside me. And the whole of his, that's, that's a picture of his whole empire. And actually, it's a picture of the world that is against God. I am, and there is no one beside me. I am God. I am the one. And those of us who grew up, as I said so many times, who grew up in the 60s or 70s and on, that was our thought. I am, and there's no one beside me. And I want what I want, and I want it now. And what we're getting today is the result of that culture, that post-war culture that said, I am going to do what I want when I want. And that's more or less what Nebuchadnezzar did in chapter four. He, he asks Daniel for the interpretation uh, of a dream that he has in chapter four, that, where God tells him, if you continue in this way, you know, you're going to be in trouble here. And, but he asks Daniel for the interpretation. Daniel gives him the interpretation and he still continues. It's quite amazing. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, I think it is. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was standing on, uh, standing on the roof of my, my house, looking out over my kingdom, and saying, look what I've done. It might be to chapter 3, uh, verse 3 or verse 4, I can't remember, but it's in those first verses. And he says he's looking out, thinking, look at how great I am. Look at my wonderful kingdom. Look at what I've done. Even though God has told him through Daniel, what will happen. And Nebuchadnezzar had had experience of God before, but he completely, he decided not just to kind of ignore it, but to almost speak against it. It's, it's like he's saying, well, you're saying this, and I know you've done a couple of things in the past, but do you know what? I just feel like I am totally exempt from this. You want to look at the Western culture? There it is. There it is. You may be real. I mean, you know, there may be some sort of a God out there, but I prefer to kind of stick with my sorceries and my magicians, and I think I'm going to go that way. You know, I mean, there can't just be one God now. Surely all roads lead to Rome. Nothing. You know, why, why would we have to go this way? Why is it only through Jesus? I think that's just arrogance and intolerance and bigotry. Because why? Because I know best. Because my mind decides what's right and what's wrong. Because I am the arbiter of good and bad, of wickedness and goodness. I am the one who decides. And that's a, it, it's a predominantly Western uh, trait, but it's also everywhere in, um, in the world. It is the human condition. I decide what I am doing with my life. And you see it all over scripture. And here, as I say in, in Isaiah 46 and 47, you, uh, 47, sorry, and 48, you get um, God's word against this. In, in chapter 48, just to, um, before we move on to Daniel, um, verse 15, um, I, even I, have spoken. Indeed, I have called him. I have brought him, and he will make his way successful. Come near to me, listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand and your offspring like its grains. My name would never be cut off or destroyed from my presence. Here in verse 15, this is the prophecy of A, the Messiah who is coming, but before then, the one who is going to let his people go back to Jerusalem. It is the prophecy or the 
pick this Cyrus who he's going to raise up and is going to later mention by name in Isaiah, this picture of the one who's going to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem. And, um, and if, if, if only, it's like you hear God's heart here, if only, if only you had not rebelled. If only you had not rebelled. That was my heart for you, was for you to do and be the, the glorious chief of nations and not the tail, the, the ones who would lead the way and show my goodness and mercy, but you would not do it. If only you had paid attention to my commandments. I feel like we could say that to the church. It makes me cry to think of it. If only you had paid attention. If only you had just paid attention and not gone off on so many different avenues of things that you thought were best, that actually were good, but were not what I called you to be. I put that quote on Facebook. Um, someone put it on, I think it might have been you, he put a little video on the Signal uh, app prayer through, and it was a quote from Martin Luther King, darkness cannot dispel darkness, and hate cannot drive out hate. Only light can dispel darkness, and only love can dispel hate. And, and I feel with everything in me, you know, as a church, why did we not concentrate on being the light? Why did we not individually and corporately decide that we don't know how to be light, therefore we will ask the Lord God to be light through us? We will let him decide what's important. We will let him decide to lead whichever way he wants to go. Why did we not do that? As a church now I'm talking about, why did we not do that? I think we got the love bit, okay? But we made love equal tolerance. We made it mean something else. Because we thought that was best. Because we thought we knew best. So, um, verse 20, and I'm saying this only because this really pertains to Revelation 18. Revelation 17 and 18 deal with the destruction of Babylon, the world, the world power, if you like, the world culture, uh, which is called Babylon again in Revelation. And in uh, Isaiah 48, verse 20, he says, Go forth from Babylon which you will find in verse 4 of Revelation 18. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, declare with the sound of joyful shouting, proclaim this, send it out to the end of the earth, say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made the water flow out of the rock for them. He split the rock and the water gushed forth. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. And then um, you could go on and on. I could go on and on through Isaiah because there's a wonderful prophecy of um, everything that's going to happen. So go out from Babylon. That is a repeated statement through scripture. Go out from Babylon because in the end, in Revelation 18, God will say the same thing. Come out, come out of her, my people, because she is going to be destroyed. Never, ever, ever think. God will not have his way. That is just a repeated, um, a repeated truth through scripture. So um, now I think, now having seen Isaiah 47, if we're in a position to actually see Daniel 5, because Daniel 5 is the, is the result of God's word in Isaiah 47 and 48. Because Daniel 5 is the end of the Babylonian Empire. It's the end. It's when God does actually do what he says he's going to do. He's going to destroy that Babylonian Empire. And so here in Daniel chapter 5, um, what we see is that Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the, presence of the thousand. Now it's really important, as you, I hope you've read through Daniel 5, I'm trusting that you have, um, so you know what happens at the end of the chapter, you know how this chapter plays out. So it should be astonishing to us that he's, he's having a feast for a thousand of his nobles, because this city is being besieged. 
At the very moment he's having this party, the enemy is at the gate, almost. <laughs> and they think that they, it's impossible for the enemy to come in. It's the Medo Persian Empire that are going to take over the Babylonians. And they think it's impossible because they have these huge water channels running under the city, and they think that no one can get in. Mm -hmm. So they think they're impenetrable. And, uh, and, and Belshazzar is having a great party while it goes on. The name Bel means the god Marduk, actually. So he's, um, he's probably expecting that god to protect him. Um, and I think, you know, he's having this party maybe to say to his people, his nobles and his people, look, we're not worried. We're not worried. You know, what is that saying we have? Um, uh, eat, drink and be merry. But tomorrow we die, or we get the first part, but not the second. Tomorrow we die. And that was true for Belshazzar and his, and his uh, land. Apparently, archaeologists have found a huge room which was 55 feet wide and 165 foot long. So it was more than big enough to have all of these people in. Um, again, that interests me, may not interest you. And, uh, and within the city, there was apparently enough supplies to last 20 years. Mm. So they thought that they could camp out in there, at least the nobles could in the palace, they could camp out in the city and nobody would be able to take them. And of course, they didn't count on God. When Belshazzar, verse 2 of chapter 5, when Belshazzar, the king, uh, sorry, when Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Uh, in, his, in their drinking, they're praising other gods. I mean, it is the height of um, rebellion. It's the height of um, kind of insolence. insolence in a way. Insolence, yes. yeah. And, and it's interesting because you won't be picking that up necessarily. You will if you know this, the account of Daniel. But it's not necessarily that you're going to pick that up, but what Daniel is going to say to him, there are some verses in um, Daniel 5 from verse 22 down to verse 23, which really encapsulate the thinking of Belshazzar and actually the whole empire. And I think they encapsulate the thinking of the entire world, the, the picture of the world that we're given in the Babylonian Empire. So this 20, uh, so this five, uh, chapter five, there's two to four, they're drinking, they are um, praising other gods, and um, all the king's wives and concubines are all doing the same thing. Verse five, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. And if, I, I don't know that, whether you know this, but this basically means it's like he's had an enema, his body evacuates. So he is really terrified. This is not just kind of slight knocking of the knees and I'm a little bit scared. This is real terror that he's feeling. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. But there is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. 
And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, Belshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare to the, to the interpretation. So this is the queen, almost certainly the queen mother, um, because it says in um, the first couple of verses that all his wives and his concubines were there drinking. So this is almost certainly the queen, the king's mother, and um, she's come and she's reminded him of this man called Daniel, who um, who uh, was able to uh, interpret dreams and have great wisdom. Um, and so uh, uh, Belteshar has then called him, verse um, 13, and Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you, are you that Daniel who was one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now, the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read the instruction and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are not able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, when you think about this, you will have authority as the third ruler. Belshazzar was, was a, a regent, if you like. He was co-reigning with his father, Nabonidus. So basically, this would mean whoever interpreted this handwriting would be third, like, you know, the third king on the throne, basically. So this is what's being offered. That's the amount of Belshazzar's terror. That's how afraid he was, that he was willing. And the purple robe, of course, you remember in Esther when Mordecai is um, given the purple robe, or um, Haman, Haman wants the purple robe, but Mordecai is the one who gets it. It's a, you know, a symbol of authority and power. Um, and uh, probably, um, He's promising Daniel the same kind of rewards um, that he had to promise anybody, everybody else because the inscription is in Aramaic. And um, Daniel has already um, learned the language, uh, knows the language. And um, uh, I think it must have been a difficult thing to read on the wall because he had to call in people. It was obvious the king couldn't read it himself or couldn't understand it and interpret it. So he wanted to call in people. So, verse 17, here's Daniel speaking to the king. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Now, I know that you know, a lot of times we think about Daniel and uh, he's portrayed as the perfect Christian. Well, first of all, there is no perfect Christian. It is impossible for you and I individually to be a perfect Christian. It's impossible. We will not be perfect until the day we see Jesus Christ face to face, when we will be like him. That's what John says in 1 John. So we can never be Daniel as he is portrayed in this book. He's a Jew, first of all. He's not a Christian. There were no Christians before Pentecost. They were just, and we've gone over this, and I really want to go over it more and more because it is a major heresy in the church, in this land, that the church has replaced Israel. It has not and never will, and all of scripture denies it. All of scripture denies it. So, but we're told and taught often that, well, dare to be a Daniel, be Daniel, do this, do that. And that's not bad and it's not wrong because, of course, he lived a holy life and he honoured and worshipped his God in really difficult circumstances. And we began this study by looking at him and seeing how we could kind of emulate him. But Daniel is a picture of Christ. 
He's a picture of the one who could do, the, could be the perfect man, the perfect person, the perfect Christian. He's a picture of Christ. And it's together as the church that we come closest to imitating him. Paul will say, he will say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Of course, we are imitating certain things about Christ, but always with the understanding that in and of myself, I am unable. And even with the Holy Spirit in me, the Holy Spirit in me will not enable me to be Christ. He won't. Why? Because my pride would automatically take over and I would suddenly be the best Christian that ever lived. And you better come to me to find out everything. Which is the opposite of what God's telling us in Scripture. I need you, you need me. Together we become the body of Christ. Together we are the body of Christ, and together we function as the body of Christ. And it's so important because those two things are true in our day. The place of theology is a massive heresy in the church, and this idea that you and I can do what Jesus did individually, we cannot. It's part of this kingdom now theology, this dominion, dominionism, where believers are being taught that it is possible to do greater things than Jesus did individually, to be as powerful as Christ was, because we have the spirit within us, and why would that not be true? And forgive me, because I've said that many times, so forgive me online, I know you always hear it, you must be thinking, oh, not again, but I don't, I just want to emphasise it over and over and over. We are a body, we are a holy temple, living stones being put together to make a fitting place for the Spirit of the Lord. We are only a fitting place for the Spirit of the Lord when we are together, together as the body of he has given us his spirit by grace, but that spirit is always connecting to the spirit in each person. It's always connecting us to other believers so that together we can do and be what we are supposed to be. And when you read the scriptures, the you in scripture is almost always entirely plural. It is virtually never, a few times it is, but almost never is it a singular you when speaking about what the church will be? You are the light of the world. Well, you individually are not the light of the world. I know that's a shock maybe to some people, but you are not. But together, we are the light of the world. So Daniel is, I, I, I want to say that because in, Daniel comes through this book as a, just a mighty, mighty, mighty man of God. And I wish I could be like him. I wish I could be like him. But I, that's what's pointing me always to Jesus. Always pointing me to Jesus. I want to be like Christ. It's like Daniel could write off the pages of this book, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm showing you a picture of who Christ is. Um, so Daniel, he says, um, you know, keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. I will read the inscription. And what made me think of all of that was that you know, we so often want to take the praise and the gifts and the everything. We so often want the glory that is really only attributable to God. Accolades, accolades, absolutely. O King, the Most High God, sorry, O King, the Most High God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before them. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beasts, and his dwelling place was with wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. And here are the verses which I really think sum up 
this chapter and Belshazzar and Babylon and, and the world. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, that you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and your, you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not hear, sorry, do not see, hear or understand. But the God in whose hand of your life, breath, and your ways you have not glorified. Now you know if you've been online ever, you know that I think that the the, the, the history of Israel and the and the things that happened to Israel um, are a comparison set for the church rather than the world. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says that the things that were written long ago was written as, as examples to us who have inherited salvation. So it, we, we, the whole of the Old Testament in one way is written as an example to the church. So when we're comparing what the Bible says about Israel, uh, Israel that's not a comparison to the world. That's a comparison to the church. Israel is comparatively like the church in the way that it has rebelled, in the way that it refused to obey commandments, in the way that it did, did things and went against God. But here, we're talking about Belshazzar, the Babylonian king. We're talking about God's appraisal of the world. And this matches directly with Romans 1. Romans 1 verse 18 says that the wrath of God is being poured out against all the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who have um, exchanged, well, sorry, I'm just quoting, all the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who, hold on a moment, I'll be there, um, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1 verse 18. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You have to know truth in order to suppress it. This is not... A God speaking to the world who do not know the truth. This is God speaking to the world who have evidence of his existence. Paul has, has he's going to just say, for since the creator, because that which is known about God is evident within them. Every single human being has an understanding that there is something bigger than themselves. They may not call it God, they may call it something different, but God has definitely put that evidence of himself within every person and then he's going to go on for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse so in god's economy in his viewpoint when he looks at the world he says every single human being is born with the knowledge of my me the knowledge of god the knowledge that i exist uh, ecclesiastes will say he set eternity in the heart of man in the heart of human beings so god has made himself evident inside every man now of course your upbringing your things that happen to you your uh, hereditary stuff all plays a part to deafen that and silence that evidence within you. I'm not saying it doesn't, but, but make no mistake, every single person is born with the knowledge of God within them. And then they're given evidence of him in the creation. In the creation and... Um, yeah, sorry, let me go back there. In, in the creation where they see his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. And this is what God says, it is clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Now, I'm not saying that every single person looks at, the, you know, at Mount Everest and sees the beauty of it and the amazingness of it, and they say, well, they must be a God. But I'm talking about as a general thing, when God looks at the human race, he is holding us all accountable for knowledge that we have of him. And he's saying, I told you about myself inside you. I put that knowledge inside you. You might call it a conscience. You might call it, you know, just this understanding that there's something bigger than you. Whatever it is, 
I gave you that knowledge. I gave you that knowledge. And I showed you my power when you look out at the universe, when you look at this world. And you are being held accountable, not that you couldn't see it, not that you didn't know it, but that you suppressed it. That you suppressed it. You, you know, when you think about our nation, when you think about our part of the world, and think about the amount of gospel preaching there has been over the last, I don't know, a thousand years, two thousand years, how much of our Western world particularly has heard the gospel? I mean, I, it must be, up until the other day, it must have been 95%. <laughs> And people knew the truth about Jesus. They knew who he was. I knew the truth about Jesus when I was a child. I was taught it at school. I was taught about it in school. You were too, mostly. So, so it's, it's this kind of, what God is calling them to account for is not what they didn't know, but what they did know and suppressed. That's the truth of judgment. You are not held accountable for something you couldn't know or didn't know or, or it was unable for you to access. You are held accountable for the truth that you suppressed. And, and, and what God says in Romans and what he's saying to uh, Belshazzar is, you knew this stuff. You had the witness of your own father, ancestor in front of you. You knew this stuff but you refused to accept and receive it. You refused to put your trust in it. You refused to actually uh, acknowledge it. That's the judgment. That's the judgment. That's why uh, Belshazzar is going to lose his kingdom in one day, as Isaiah 46 says, in one day, you are going to, uh, the Chaldeans will lose their empire. And they did. In one day, this happened. The Medo-Persians, the Persians were the, by far the biggest part of that empire, but the Medo-Persians would come against Babylon and take the city in one day. So Daniel now is going to tell them, verse 24, then the hand was sent from him and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, take out that parson. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about age 62. I mean, it's quite incredible to me that he went through with the thing that he promised after he'd been told this. But, um, you know, what, what Daniel has done is summarised God's dealings with, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, his, his uh, predecessor, and he's talked about what Nebuchadnezzar learned because of what God dealt with him how God dealt with him. He's told him God is still great and rules over nations. He raises up people. He, he you know, reduces nations. Um, and, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was brought to a high position of power and by God, actually, because you see that in Daniel 4, that he was really uh, laid low and humbled. But then at the end, he was restored to his kingdom. His kingdom carried on for probably another 20 years uh, after that time. But Belshazzar, knowing all of this, knowing all of it, had just refused to acknowledge this God. And, um, and so, uh, you know, he had gone over to worshipping idols that have no life. And that's what I mean about our nation. We know about God. We know about God. There's no excuse. We know about God. There is no excuse. No one's going to be able to stand before God and say, you know, I just didn't know. I mean, I'm the, I'm the one human being that didn't have any knowledge of himself, of you and me. And, and I didn't, I wasn't able to look at the creation. I couldn't look at the stars at night. There's no one. There's no one. 
and God will hold people accountable. That's the that's the judgment that they will be accountable for what they know. The judgment uh, on the wall, um, you know, uh, Menes and Aramaic noun apparently, which refers to a weight of fifty shekels, and uh, it comes from the word mena, which means to number or to reckon. Tekel is uh, a shekel, which is about two fifths of an ounce, and it's from the verb to weigh. And uh, parson is a noun which means half um, or about two thirds of a pound, and it means to break into, to divide. Um, and the, the word on the wall is actually a parson, which means and parson. So, nene, nene, tekel, and parson. So, the wise men couldn't read the words, they didn't know what they meant. They couldn't have interpreted the words, even if they had been able to read them, because they had no point of reference as to what they, as to what they meant. So Daniel uh, tells him, basically, you have missed the mark. Your character has not reached what it should have been. And, um, and it should have been like that, because you had all of that knowledge. That's what's really key. That's what I mean about the key verses in this chapter. Because Belshazzar is being uh, judged because he has not humbled himself in the face of the knowledge of God. And, um, and so then that's why Daniel is telling you, your kingdom is going to be taken, um, taken from you. So, I mean, as we finish, really, um, you know, I think there's a few things, obviously, that we can take from this, apart from the actual account of Belshazzar losing the kingdom in one day. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, well, as I say, especially in the Western world, but actually perhaps even all over the world now, certainly in Asia, um, the Chinese have definitely heard about God because they have a massive driving church there, underground, but it's a massive church. Um, but, you know, the powers in this world that we're seeing actually rise up at the moment and start to take power and use it for different sorts of purposes than we have historically seen. Uh, they know about God. Make no mistake, they know about God. I think it's quite difficult to find people in power who don't know about God. I, I don't know if it's possible, but I would think it's impossible to find a politician or a business magnate or someone who doesn't know anything about God. Um, but they've chosen sides. That's another thing, you know. Once you recognize that God says everyone has knowledge of me, then you also have to recognize that those who don't acknowledge him have chosen another side. And I've said a lot for a long time, you know, I can remember when I used to beg God to save my husband or my son or whoever it was I was praying for praying for, please, 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 won't you save him, won't you open his eyes. It came out of a Calvinistic, a wrong Calvinistic understanding of salvation. But it also came out of me identifying with those human beings that I loved. And wanted, longing for God to do something. And I know that there was a, a I don't know if it was a day, but there was a time when God really showed me that if I had chosen him, I had chosen him. And I had, when in that choice, I had moved sides. I know that sounds like a bit of a ridiculous thing, but, and, and I was to pray from his side. So what happened was I started to say to the Lord, I am so sorry that in the face of all the evidence that you've given them, these people in my life don't believe. I am so sorry. Won't you make me what you want me to be that they might believe? And it totally changed the way I prayed for them. I stopped begging for God to save them because it was like he was saying, you don't have to beg me. I want to save them, but I will not override their will. I gave them will. I gave them choice and I will not override it. It's a fundamental truth about God. So I suppose what I, you know, what I see with Daniel is he knew the sign he was on. It was clear for him. 
And everything he did, his whole life, no matter what it was, no matter how difficult it was, he never changed sides. He didn't go back. We always want to go back. We want to be with the people who are poor you, you know. And I don't know why God, you know, why are you not doing it, God? Why are you not saving them? It's like I told you before, you know, when, when one time a few years ago, I prayed with my husband, you know, because he said, if God would just give me a sign, and I prayed that prayer with my husband. Oh, God, please give him a sign. And the next morning, like a massive thunderbolt into my head was, do not ever ask me for a sign again. No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. It was real. I mean, it wasn't, I, mean, I wasn't afraid, but it was really strong. Don't keep asking for another sign. What can I do apart from Jesus? What will I do apart from Jesus? In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him is life and life eternal. I have given the sign of the ages. Just keep looking to him. But as I say, we, we somehow, we just forget that and we change sides. Um, I think... I think as you can see in Daniel, Daniel now from Daniel 6 onwards, it's going to really get darker in Daniel. I mean, as if being in the lion's den or in, sorry, the fiery furnace isn't dark enough, but it's going to get darker for Daniel. Um, we're going to really stop hearing a little bit. Next chapter, we'll hear about his friends as well. But then from chapter 7 on, we really get into the visions that Daniel has and the dreams that he had and the confirmation of world history that this he would write down history as it relates to Israel um, but here I think we're, we're shown at the end of Daniel chapter 5 that there's a limit to God's uh, silence in the face of rebellion there's a limit he will put an end to the rebellion of the world and we know that that's going to come and we know that currently we're living in a day or a time, an age that is called today. I love that. I love that, that um, the church age is called today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the Hebrews 3, verse 13, talk about this day that we're living in. And, uh, you know, Belshazzar lived in a day for his time because he had all the knowledge of God and refused. And, and that's what's happening in our day. People have all the knowledge of God and they're refusing. I'm just trying to find. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. That encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Today is the day that we have for to offer salvation, and we have to do it. And the thing is, you know, as I said before, Israel, the pictures of Israel, I like them to the church. You know, we are given choice. Your choice, my choice, is not taken away when we believe. We still have a choice a million times a day, and we have a choice whether to believe deception. And by far the largest part of the Western church has chosen deception over the truth mm. because they have chosen replacement theology, they have chosen to believe that uh, in kingdom now theology, they have chosen to follow after um, deceptive heresies, heresies, the speculations of men. I'm not talking about whether people are saved or not. That's not, I'm so thankful that's not up to me. All I can say is, we are called to live by the word of God. And those theories, those theologies are the opposite. So we're given a choice. We can stay firm. We can keep going. We can keep trusting the word. We can keep being made free by the truth of Jesus, which I know is happening to me. You, you know that too. You're, that's happening as you study and as you read. Some of your thinking has changed. Some, Lots of your behaviour has changed. The way you love, the way you respond to people is all being changed. And that's because by the Spirit of God, he is changing you through his word. 
He is making good on this promise that I keep pointing there. You can't see it online, but it's the one on the wall. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free to stand, free to love, free to be the light, free to connect with people who love God and love this word. People free to decide to, to live and to actually run with the footman. I started with Jeremiah. I wish I could go back and find that, but to run with the footman and not complain. You know, well, these are difficult days. And, and, and underneath the difficulty of the surface of these days, there is massive, massive confusion and chaos. And and it's going to get worse. So um, we have to choose every day to follow to follow the Lord. Um, I think I haven't checked my time, so I'm probably going over my time, and I'm sorry about that. You're all sitting at home, so you probably went whipped off to get a cup of coffee or something, but no one can do that here. So um, yeah, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us truth. We thank you that your word is is given for us. We thank you that Jesus, who is the word, came and lived and died and rose again, that we might know eternity with you. We just thank you, Lord, so much for it and ask that you would just continue on with us, weak and failing as we are, that you would continue to, to feed us with your word and strengthen us by your spirit, Lord, that we might really stand and stand firm that we would remember all those things you teach us, Lord, and put on that full armour of God that we have through Christ and pick up our sword of the Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that you have opened up to us this book, this Bible that tells us that you, you, you love us. It tells us who you are and all that you have planned. And it enables us, Lord, to stare into the face of darkness and see the light of Christ. And we thank you so much for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.